the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast is just two guys and maybe a guest or two discussing Bitcoin, Bitcoin equities, and the related macroeconomic space. It's not meant to be financial advice. So please, if you're doing any investing after listening to our program, do your own research, do your own due diligence, and understand that any money you invest can be lost. The show is meant for entertainment purposes only, and we hope you enjoy the program. Friends and enemies. Jeez, that's the second time I tried going live. The first time they didn't work. Anyways, <laughs> welcome aboard for another edition of the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast. Uh, so we'll be chatting with fundamentals in just a moment. Jeez, the, the intro music didn't play. For whatever reason, I clicked on the go live button. It didn't go live. We had a snafu, but whatever. Here I am. I'll be able to pick up the pieces and we'll continue on just a moment. Either way, before I, I bring fundamentals on and chat about, you know, there's so much to chat about what's going on in terms of the attack vectors that are going after Bitcoin, all the, the the noise that's out there, there is some signal and fundamentals is going to help find where it is. And of course, he's also part of the signal as well. So with that being said, there's a couple of sponsors I want to talk about. Our first sponsor is Easy DNS. And if you haven't used them yet, I suggest do so. If you are looking to open up or start your own web page, or if you have your own web page and you want to move over to a better source, better solution, better service, well, Easy DNS got you covered. They, you could migrate over to them. So a lot of different options over there. You could also migrate your email services over there so you can have it hosted with Easy DNS. Virtual private servers, they have you covered if you want to do Nostr relays. Nostr is a really cool way to talk to people. It's a decentralized platform. Imagine Twitter, but without an algorithm and without all the the crap that goes along with Twitter. You could say what you want, you could do what you want, and you could be whoever you want on Nostr. You can also do no list IO implementations with easy DNS. These guys, they'll allow you to buy with Bitcoin. So you could pay with Canadian dollars. I think they'll take even American dollars. I'm not sure, but certainly they'll take Bitcoin. So they give you a lot of different options in which you want to pay and they'll accept your currency. Sometimes it's going to be fiat. Sometimes it'll be hard currency. They'll be happy to take whatever you got to offer. But they have top-notch service. Mark and their team is always there to help out. They've helped us out quite a bit. We have started our CanadianBitcoiners.com. We're over there, and it's thanks to Mark and team we're able to, well, at least have some representation on the web. And so if you want to have your web hosting done, DNS purchases, um, email hosting, you know, all this, you're not going to get rugged with these guys. They've been around for decades. It's plural. Since the 90s, they've been around. A lot of other teams, a lot of other companies, similar companies have come and gone. So check them out. And if you use our code CBP Media, you get 50% off your initial purchase. And we have a second sponsor, and that is Bull Bitcoin. And Bull Bitcoin is a great place to buy. And you can sell if you want your Bitcoin, although I wouldn't recommend selling it, but that's my financial advice. Do your own research. And you could buy on chain. And when fees get a little bit high, you could also buy with Lightning. Let me take a peek right now. What are the fees? They are 13 sats per V-byte, so it's pretty darn cheap. So yeah, they use your on-chain right now. But if indeed this gets congested and fees get a little bit higher, then you could, you could use the lightning options that Bull Bitcoin has to give you. And also you could spend your Bitcoin to pay your bills. So if you have a car payment, you have mortgage payment, you have electricity bills to pay, whatever it is, you could use your account on Bull Bitcoin and use your Bitcoin to pay those bills. Pretty cool stuff. Secondly, you could also use your Bitcoin to buy gift cards and use those gift cards in the real world, so like a Home Depot or whatever it is. And so you're kind of indirectly spending your Bitcoin in the real world. And this is all thanks to the gift cards that you could buy through Bull Bitcoin. So check them out. They, If you haven't yet opened an account, do so. Use our promo code below. If you do that, fund your account and provide the necessary information 21 bucks will be added to your account and then you can start buying some bitcoin check that out pretty handy stuff but with this being done i want to bring on the man of the hour fundamentals how are you buddy i'm great man great to be here what's yes. up well living the dream as you could tell and uh <laughs> i, I want to hear you know what thank you i i take i took a week off Last week, because I don't want to say exactly why, but if people want to see, you could just dig in. Just, those motherfuckers from the, the magazine. It's, yeah, anyways. Um, 
Uh, you know what, Mr. Fundamentals, I, I want to hear a little bit more about you. For people who are not aware who you are, I want to hear your story, who the heck you are, how you got in Bitcoin, started your own podcast, and I want to know how you ended up here on the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast. So the floor is yours, buddy. All right. Well, okay. So I am, um, by training, an actuary. Um, started that path 30 years ago in the year 1994. And... Um, you know, was always sort of like good at math and um, I kind of, I mean, I've always had like undiagnosed autism and never really fit in. And, um, you know, I was able to, so that was like a career path for people that like were, couldn't do anything traditional. And um, I immediately hated it and hated everybody in it and realized that they were all frauds and felt very stuck. And, um, you know, just kind of like, you know, toughed it out. And then eventually became a like a quant for um, trading desk risk risk desks. Did you speak English though? Because it, uh, if you watch the movie, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Um, the the Big Short. They had yeah. the quant on there, and he didn't. They claimed he didn't speak English, but he did in fact. So you spoke English, right? I spoke English. I mean, I'm I was like I was like an actuary quant, meaning like he didn't really have the math. <laughs> right. I, had to, I, had to, I had to teach it to myself. The real quants are like they don't speak English. They find them in like JFK, <laughs> JFK airport, you know, like Ukrainian refugees or whatever. But uh, they're coming in by the plane low these days, right? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of quants. I mean, there's a lot of people who are like, there's a lot of people who are really good at math in this world that don't work because, you know, because fiat, actually. Right. Um, but anyway, this was any, this was the path that I ended up taking. And so for the last 20 years, I would say I've been working, um, managing hedging, hedging programs on a risk desk um, for large insurance companies that sold investment guarantees, which sounds stupid, but we did sell them, meaning like, you know, whatever happens to your investments, it's your principal is guaranteed. And so we're able to run hedging for that. It's actually not that complicated um i don't know maybe it is it gets more complicated over time naturally because like the initial idea is well you know you just you know uh you just hedge out the thing but over time the risk gets more complicated mm -hmm. and frankly untenable um and i think they're all i think all these companies are in a lot of trouble right now but whatever not really not really our problem so it's been like a 30-year journey of um 30-year journey of that, kind of always being odd man out, never satisfied. And, um, you know, I came to Bitcoin. I, I bought my first Bitcoin in 2022 after really the year 2021. It was a very confusing year. But, like, for me, it had nothing to do with my profession. It had everything – like, it actually had a lot to do with me socially where I was – I was what I call a woke supremacist. Um I was one of those guys, like the you know, white knight. Um, and, you know, with the whole vaccine um, issue, it just kind of like pulled the wool off and exposed all of them as LARPs and inauthentic. And like the 20 years of me building friendships, like all kind of dissolved into nothing. Because um, I felt very strongly about uh, vaccine mandates not being good, not being okay. And um, all of these people who believe that an in injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere couldn't seem to see the injustice going on. And so I'm like, they're either total LARPs or they're fucking stupid. And I'm really stupid, obviously, for giving my life to this for so long and started over. And then it's almost like all of a sudden Bitcoin just shows up in my face. Like as soon as that happens, as soon as I realize what a fucking moron I am, uh, this, this Bitcoin thing shows up. And for somebody who is, you know, very risk minded, quantitative analytical, who also like very conservative financially, like live below my means since 2008, you know, kept all my money in cash. Like, didn't believe in the more. I really didn't believe in the opportunities in the more. I didn't believe that any of that growth was real. Just, you know, I just wanted to save my money. Like, and that, and mm -hmm. I didn't, like, I knew I was getting bled out, but it, 
I was like everybody else in like the 2010s was like, where's the inflation? I guess we don't really see it, you know? And um, so I definitely got fooled there as well. But when Bitcoin showed up, it was just like, an, it was like a lightning bolt, just immediately, holy shit. This is, not only is this the thing, but this is like, this is showing up now. This is like once in a lifetime, not just lifetime. This is like once in a hundred lifetimes. Mm-hmm. And I fell just, I fell so hard down the rabbit hole. I don't even know where I am right now. Open your eyes. You're in the right place, which is good. And you're surrounded by friends. Absolutely. Some enemies too, but uh, and, you know that's the way Bitcoin works. It's for everybody that wants it. Now I got to ask you because you, you were knee deep. Well, shit, you were fucking neck deep in fiat for, for quite a while. Now, as you so slowly became aware about how money it helped out the people that were closest to it, backed by nothing, all that stuff. Did you look at gold initially? Because, you know, looking at hard money, something that has value that's hard to reproduce and difficult, in this case, difficult to mine. Did you look at gold as an opportunity, something to buy before you even got into Bitcoin? No, I did not. I was psyoped, I would say, by um, the investment class that laughed at gold. And I never even heard the phrase Austrian economics until... January of 22, watching Nobody Caribou's video where he casually mentions Austrian economics. And I was like, what the hell is that? Yeah. See, a, a lot of people, I mean, good for you that you avoided gold. Um, I I did buy a little bit uh, into the ETFs. Um, I, I, I was for a period of time a gold bug. And thankfully, I am no longer in that group. It just... I understand the value of it, but just the manipulation and the the problems of custing it, and you know, it's it's very difficult to custody it. It's very difficult to move it over distances. And Bitcoin, obviously, it solves a lot of those problems. So, luckily for me, I got out of it. And uh, yeah. good for you for never getting into it. But I mean, I'd um, love to be able to say I saw through it, but honestly, it was just ne- it never entered my radar. Like shit coins. I mean, it's like I didn't see through those either. I just it just never occurred as interesting or anything I should pay attention to. So you never bought into, never dealt with shit coins, traded it, any of that? No. <laughs> wow, good for you. See, I no. I can't say the same. But I came I, in I, in 2022, you got to understand. So it's like, I think that by the time, like by the time I might have, like by the time I might have come up for air and seen it as interesting, they were already blowing up. It was already, like already Luna was gone. You know, it was already like yeah, disgusting. That's fair. Are you, surprisingly, though, there are people that are coming into this space, even in the last 12 months after you, they don't see that. They see shitcoins as an opportunity to make some tremendous gains over a short period of time. They're not looking at the fundamentals. They're not looking at the people behind the project. They're not looking at the fact that it's a scam. So they're also not even looking, though, yeah, they're not looking at the fact that, it, well, I mean, in the best case scenario, it still pays out in USD slave money. And it's like, well, like, What's the fucking point, right? Yeah, like they're just looking for gains. So there's a class of people, even in Bitcoin, they're just looking for gains, right? Well, eventually you guys started a podcast, and yes. I want to hear about uh, that because that's yeah, that's an right. interesting journey. So go ahead. Well, um, very quickly into my journey, it became apparent that I was going to have to find at least a meetup, or else my wife was going to murder me. <laughs> um, like. I think two or three months, and I, I, um, I think I had a call. Like I, I, um, I had a call with like uh, Swan Private just to ask some questions, and then I think I was talking to Terrence, and I was like, "Hey, mind if I run, like run some ideas by you?" And he was like, "I think you better. I think you should find a meetup. I think you, you know." And then so I did, right? So I found, I, I, could, I realized I couldn't even get enough of meetups, and then I found out that there was a meetup ninety miles away, and I went to that. Um, was it in your state? In my state, yes. And that's where I met Business Cat. I was actually on my way to do a college visit with my daughter. And I knew I had known that he had scheduled a meetup on that day. So I stopped by and met Business Cat. And it was just like, you know, sort of immediately just kind of like the Terminator, you know, just immediately recognized him as like fucking partner. You know, we didn't, we didn't really, it took, 
I started going regularly to that meetup. So I started traveling regularly to that. And, you know, I go to like five or six meetups a month. Oh. Uh, I, st- I, st- I still can't get enough of them. I'll, you know, and I'll do, I'll do podcasts. I do, it's just like, don't get enough of it. But I started going regularly and getting to know business cat. And probably in about five or six months, we started talking about starting a podcast. Like he had it in him for a long time and didn't really, I guess, didn't, I'm not sure what was stopping him. Right. But maybe just somehow with me saw just the ability to get over the, over whatever hump. Right. And are, are, are both you guys in Philly? No, he's out in central Pennsylvania. Got it. I don't think that's a secret. So that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, if, if it wasn't now, it's uh, out in the uh, open. <laughs> I don't think it's a secret. So, but um, yeah. So like, I mean, we just kind of hooked up right away and then we said, Hey, let's, let's try this. Let's do five episodes and see what happens. And so uh, I think I mean, we did about, we did five episodes and three of them we didn't air because they were like three hours of garbage. Um, but so I think we just ripped, we're about to drop it tomorrow. I think we ripped 38, number 38. So we've done over 40. We've probably had five that haven't made, made the airwaves. And, um, you know, he and I really do have the same sensibility. Like we, I, we don't, we started out really not caring if anybody even listened. Like we are like, God is listening <laughs> and we are going to do this because we're creating the world we want to live in. And it does turn out like we are now starting to see people kind of hop on, you know, hop on board. And it's great. It's, it's just cool. So you guys release Thursday mornings, but it's not every Thursday morning. It seems like every, every other every week. We started yeah. out every week, but then, um, you know, business guy had to go have another baby. <laughs> Terrible stuff. <laughs> Rock, paper, Bitcoin is the name. Explain the yes. name. Okay, great. Um, I, it's something I, it's, it's a blog post I wrote called Rock, Paper, Bitcoin that we never talk about it on the show. We just kind of used it for the show because we needed a name and it was cool. But like, it, it is a meaningful construct for me. It, I, I wrote a blog post thinking of rock as gold or rock as physical things paper as abstract things and bitcoin as like metaphysical very real things and so like this trichotomy to reconcile the fact that bitcoin exists in the world and i had to now go back 49 years of my life and re recreate everything i thought i knew that's in a nutshell what it represents it's it was the construct for me to like look at all these things that are now i i now doubt my understanding of and rebuilding, how to rebuild my understanding. And I'd say the essence of that is what we do every other week. Like we really are like rebuilding our understanding of the world in the presence of Bitcoin. It's like, okay, Bitcoin's here. Now what the fuck do we do? Yeah, you guys go deep. Like it's almost philosophical discussions. But, so it's it's an interesting, like as opposed to Joey and I, like we're so, sometimes we're pissed, sometimes we're laughing. <laughs> and we talk a lot about the, the news, but yeah, you guys really dive deep into certain topics and it's it's a it's a different it's a different podcast um so like i, the, I appreciate concept, hearing i appreciate hearing that yeah yeah the, the concept of this though who came up with it that was well that was something that i wrote it's you know that was an idea that came from me but the content of the podcast itself is really just business guy and i talking about what we're dealing with that particular week and I'd say that was primarily season one and season two is now really, um, I see it's like, you know, Frampton comes alive. This is like business cat comes alive. Like he's been holding back really his real depth. And in season two, he is going very deep on something he's been researching regarding the magnetic pole shifts and yes. Yeah. And, and it's slowly moving. And from what I understand, it may, they may switch to north and the south pole may switch over a very long period of time is that it likely will like we're at the end we're nearing the end of a twelve thousand year cycle that um could be very bad um if you know what i mean like even the con then things in the knowledge system suggest it's going to be really bad so then we're obviously not going to see it so it's not going to impact us but it's going to be our descendants we might see it no we we might you think Uh, so I'll say this. 
Um, I refuse to believe that Bitcoin comes when it does, only for it to say, ha ha, fuckers, now go fucking die in a magnetic pole shift. Okay. So I believe that Bitcoin somehow is going interrupt, to interrupt this somehow, whether it is um, we get the attention of the aliens who now maybe believe we're not going to kill each other and they're going to give us the answer, you know, or maybe we select the smartest people to go live in citadels with and find, find the parts of the earth that are going to be okay. I mean, maybe it's some natural selection will, will just do this. I mean, people will tend to over time, you know, between diseases and killing each other, they could just, you will have the, the best and brightest and strongest to end up living is just, just, just natural selection. Right. And well, they but will now find not... areas to, to, to like to live in that are, are best suited for them for, to thrive. But natural selection now, like natural selection has something now that it never had before, which is, like selecting for a low time preference, selecting for people who actually are incentivized to win with each other. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not saying there haven't been people that have done that. I'm saying that I think that now we're going to see natural select. That's going to get incorporated into natural selection. Yeah, it's it's inevitable because it, this is just ingrained in our history, and this is the way. You know, anyway, I, I have to pick your brain on something because you, like, as a reference, you live in. Pennsylvania. And I, I'd love to know for an American out there, where do you typically buy Bitcoin? Like what is something you where's a place you recommend for people to go? I'm certainly not Coinbase, but is it something no. like Swan or like what would you recommend? Uh well, I mean, if you're it's like if you're regular if you're relegated to if you accept being relegated to KYC exchanges, which you shouldn't, but in in the United States, um you know, you can you can buy Bitcoin not without KYC. It's for, it's just difficult, and you do it in small amounts. And you know, you may not be able to put your life savings into it right away. But I think that should be the first thing people you know try to do. Well, if you're, are there options like what, what? What are these options that you can say? I mean, are, are you able to disclose some of these? Or is I'm well, I mean, how- like ATMs are an option. You know. Buying from friends is an option. So Buying peer from peer. peer-to-peer, yeah. Um, I'm not that familiar with BISC, RoboSats, and the platforms people use. That's something that I'm working on. You know, like I'm, I've recognized that I probably am deficient in the no KYC SAT arena. So I needed to just put that out there and then say what I do know, <laughs> where I buy KYC, you know, exchange Bitcoin, I think River is a great place to do yeah. that. Um, yeah. That's probably my reputation. preferred place, you know. What are your thoughts on Swan? Um, I'd say not a, I'm not a fan of their business, to be honest. I, I, I like their content. Um, but I have, I'll just say this. Um, I have, I was very dismayed by the Prime Trust debacle yeah i talked about it on my podcast but i'll talk about it here that they entered a very uh you know kind of very cozy relationship with prime trust they had prime trust be the lead sponsor of their big conference and it turned out that swan was the last company to see that prime trust was going to go go down and the last company meaning like strikes the folds the coin bits of the world right they all that you know, they all jumped off the ship before Swan did, and Swan ended up nearly having their customers' keys in the hands of Ripple. Yeah, like, I, like this is such an objectively bad outcome that there should have been, um, there should have been widespread apologies and contrition, and there wasn't anything even close to it. So uh, that that type of stuff really bothered me. Yeah, Corey seems to have. A, let's be honest. He took a beating for a period of time. He, both he and Swan, but it, it seems like a year later, not quite a year, that it, they just kind of parry this attack and and they've gone, they moved on. Especially an, another piece of news that came out of them when when it was announced they're doing Bitcoin mining and that came out of left field. I, I had no idea they were even considering it. A lot of people had no idea. So 
it just seems like that you know news like that and continuing yeah. on with the Pacific Bitcoin conference and stuff. To be just, fair, it seems like oh, yeah, sorry, interesting. To be fair, right? When I first heard the mining news, I was like, oh my god, yet another thing there, another another covert operation that is not part of their core business or not part of anything they're asking people to trust them for. But to be fair, it is something they do well and. They, you know, right, it's something they're competent in, so I got, have to give them credit for that, right? Yeah, yeah. It, gathering that type of hash rate, the, the those AS, the amount of ASICs required to do it quietly and then to find a place to energize it, it's it wasn't an, an easy operation. Let's let's be honest. And to, to but the, another thing they have going for them, at least right now, is they're not publicly traded. If they were publicly well, traded, maybe they, this information would have been more readily available. Right, but their whole desire is to become at least publicly funded. Uh, they are Between, still going. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm just saying that's what led them to have the Pacific Bitcoin Conference and the Prime Trust sponsorship to begin with, which is really, to me, the first, that's the thing. You know, that's the straw that broke their back. Right, this quest for public money, and so I. This is another inauthenticity I just point out is that they say they're Bitcoin only, but you know they're really seeking fiat money. They're a fiat company, you know. They, uh, well, but they yeah. they provide they have you know they have very competent Bitcoiners there. A lot of friends that work there, right? I mean, yeah, you know, it's uncomfortable to criticize them and all that stuff, but I don't, and, and, you know, I I just find that I just find certain things so upsetting that I can't not I can't not talk about that. Yeah, is my I mean, school well, is my school that my kids go to. We actually, they went on a journey and decided to go buy Bitcoin, right? They did it through Swan. Um, like, fine, right? I mean, I, you know, I had a little bit of, I got a little bit of influence, but like, I didn't have enough influence to say, look, you know, maybe, maybe you should just at least look at a couple of other options. But the, the person in charge, just, he saw his access. He was very, you know, very impressed yeah. by, what you know, what he saw in them, and understandably, because that's what they do, right? They project a great image. Um, so he successfully does start buying Bitcoin, right? This is like my children's school. This is amazing. Like this is like, you know, really rare and incredible. But then, um, like his board starts, they started freaking out about Bitcoin in general, and the the easiest attack vector they found. For him was swan because all they did was just there's like who's a swan they googled it and then they just found like you know they found all kinds of shit and so you know frankly that put my school's dean and me in a, like a really bad spot you know um and I'm, i am upset about that i i take it they don't go to a whole ohio state <laughs> no they don't go to ohio state um yeah, it is a Waldorf school. Do you, I, I, you know, yeah, I saw the Ohio State thing. Because <laughs> that was pretty funny that the fact that that guy was talking about Bitcoin. I didn't think he did a great job at selling it, talking about ETFs and the, the attack vectors and the, all the problems, the hacks. They've been solved by the these new ETFs. But it's just funny to see that there's so many people out there, young people at that. They were, they were not impressed. They don't get it, and they booed the fuck out of Bitcoin. Like, I mean, that was the on. story. The story wasn't the kid. The story was the 20,000 other kids, right? It tells you how, you know, I'd just say th these are students that spent four years in one of the finest institutions in the land, you know, and their, you know, their finished product at their, you know, <laughs> at their uh, graduation ceremony as a finished product basically sees a choice to either ignore cheer or boo Bitcoin and they boo I'm and pretty pathetic. It is. If you figure that anybody, if a group of people, if I had to categorize by age, the group of people that probably get Bitcoin the best, I, I would right away. I would say the younger folks, the people graduating college, just because they truly understand that the price of shit has gone up so much that they have no hope in hell to succeed the same way their parents or grandparents did. And why did this happen? Well, because money is not hard anymore. You could make it very easily. And when you have more money chasing the same amount of goods, well, obviously the price goes up. So I, I can't understand how they could they could look at Bitcoin and understand the fundamentals behind it and still boo it. Like, well, I'm I might challenge perplexed. you for a second, though, because I'd say that... Go ahead. 
I would say the better group to get it would be kids that are about four years after college. Okay. That they've been working and now they really see that it's never going to happen for them. Like they see that their entire life is a bag of water with a bunch of holes in it. And, you know, like they, they just know now they are totally, they know how fucked they are. These kids still think like these, these college kids, I mean, they're more concerned with saying the right word for like neurodivergent or whatever cis by gender polarized, whatever they're, they're more, they, they, they're still more concerned with that shit than they are about inflation or economics there. They've been living for free for the last four years Right in a sort of elite conditions, um, so I, I I'm just saying like I, I, maybe I'd be really shocked if like you had a bunch of kids who've been working for four years already, mm-hmm. um, because those guys know, like those guys definitely know. And I'm wondering how many of those are chomping at the bits of having their school debt, because I'm certain that a decent proportion of the people that are graduating are carrying debt from school. School's not cheap. So they're they're probably looking at the fact that there may be a possibility of having it forgiven. And so they're yeah. probably looking at this. And this coming election is going to be a huge thing for a lot of different people. Like, have, I mean, I you see Biden every so often. There's another announcement of another swath of debt holders that are going to be forgiven. It just seems funny they're doing this over and over again. And I'm wondering if this is going to be uh, – they're just going to go right to the end and say everybody that has any sort of debt, any sort of – school debt, uh, education debt, that they're going to just cancel it all together and just. Yeah. I find that hard it. to believe because that, first of all, student loan debt is you can't even default out of it. It so, carries with you for life. Yeah. You can't, you may not default. Like you can't bankruptcy will not protect you from student loan debt. Here's a dumb question. What about death? Does it carry to somebody else or is it what happens at that point at that point in time? I'm guessing you're. I'm guessing you're out once you die. Okay, so it's it's not like you're you're in the people. But I know you're like yeah. But it is like exempted from all of. It's like the only version of debt that you can't actually wipe off through bankruptcy. Now that's why there's Father Biden over there able to say with a stroke of the pen, "Yeah, fuck you. you yeah, we will make sure that somebody else is going to pay for it. you." But you, what you, I'm you, saying you. is, it's more likely that what the government will do would be to say pause like say oh you know we'll just put a pause on you having to make your payments for for i don't know four years (laughs) you know what does that do you're kicking the can yeah but that's what they that's really the only tool they have you know like i think that they they it would be absolute chaos if they just canceled all the student loan debt i mean there would be there, there would be guns and riots you know, you take people who, you know, who did the right thing, right? They are going to get radicalized and fuck shit up. If it, it does it, seem like it, we're getting awfully close to a to a watershed moment like that, right? Like, you, if you look at, for example, just the general population, everybody's feeling a pinch. Now, not just the poor, but the rich. The rich could easily absorb it, but the people that are lower income middle class they are really feeling it because their lives have been drastically altered in the past four years the stuff that they could buy a few years ago they can't now they have to ration their money be careful with their money or just tack it onto credit cards and deal with it at a later time but i mean there's i'll give you an interesting stat that they say that 29 percent of the population in the united states have jobs but struggle to cover basic needs this is as per cnbc and if you look at that's it like a sizable amount of people in the United States, it's not going to take much for them to basically get their pitchforks and torches yeah. and storm whatever is nearby and just say, we want, we demand a change. Right. You, you must see this. You live, you, you, which city do you live in? I don't, it's, I live, you want to say it? I live um, in a Philadelphia suburb. Okay. I thought you lived in, in the actual, because Philadelphia itself has been, I, I see videos of zombie people just walking. It, it's not good over there. No. It's not great. It's so bad. it's just a matter of time before other people are just like, what the fuck is going on here? We got to do something. So I'm looking at all of this. I, I'm surprised people haven't yet just fucking demanded massive changes. But we're if we're not there yet, we're awfully close. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, th- <laughs> I think that, look, 
there's only so many ways you can buy an election and they're all going to make a lot of people really angry. Right. Yeah. You know, 2022, well, forget 2020. I mean, right. That was probably the, the most agree, like egregious, um, you know, that was the most egregious year of a buying the election, rigging the election. Who knows what, I mean, nobody really knows what went on. We all only know is that a massive amount of money was printed in 2022. Yeah. We had, they were flirting with student loan forgiveness and we drain the strategic petroleum reserve, right? These are the kinds of things that if they go too far, like by a centimeter, if they go too far by a millimeter, there'll be widespread, just, you know, there'll be people in the streets. Um, but yet that, you know, somehow they seem to be very good at knowing exactly how far to go. I mean, the, the next thing is Social Security, right? You know, all these people have been paying into Social Security their whole life. When they shit can that, that's going to cause some anger, right? Well, the Treasury, mm-hmm. U.S. Treasury is saying they're going to run short of funds in 2035 for Social Security. So this is just 11 years out. And that is their previous projection was 2036. So now it's coming even closer and closer. As soon as it's going to be 2034, 2033. And it's once that runs out, this used to be the biggest, the biggest portion of the balance sheet, right? Uh, yeah, it was, US- uh, it's well, no, actually, you mean from? It's a big unfunded liability. So, well, Social Security technically is not funded as much as oh. we've been paying into it forever, but it is what you call a pay-as-you-go <laughs> pension. So it comes out of the operating budget. Uh huh. Okay. Th- so. When I hear things like 2036, right, I am thinking that the majority of the people that would be really upset if you took Social Security away will be dead. By that, that's, I think it's that's a hope on their. They're, I they're think playing it is odds. a hope on their end. I do think, yeah, yeah. It's also like these are the people who you just can't. You know, look, there's a class of people. They're over the age of probably 70, 75. You can't touch a thing, and and as you just can't touch it. You know, these things are untouchable. But everybody knows that we're going to – everybody knows we can't support it. And that's sad, you know, yeah. it, just the way things are. And, you know, you look at – we had just mentioned Social Security is going to be coming to an end. So it just makes – or it's going to be running out of funding. Just, they're spending so much money in terms of, of continuing the debt they have, like servicing the debt. That – like it's over a trillion dollars now is spent annually on that. Something has to give. And I don't understand how that's money well spent for the United States, right? That's money that every once in a while you got to, that's, you got to pony up every once in a while. If you're going to just inflate your debt away every once in a while, you got to just pay the interest, right? Yeah. But we have, you know, we're a debt based society and we have the ability to inflate and debase all over the world. That's getting less and less. Like probably two years ago, I think 95% of the country has held U.S. reserves. Now it's like 65, something like that. But, you know, we still have the U.S. balances all over the world to debase by printing money. And so it, payments on interest is the cost of goods sold on that. What's going to happen then, the, the countries that are on the margin that are just struggling to get by, they're the ones that are going to capitulate either start adopting Bitcoin or alternatively, maybe they could get chummy with bricks. Yeah. I don't believe much in bricks, to be honest. I, I long-term it's like the reality show Alliance. That's like full of women that hate each other and you know, it's going to fall apart. They have a um, common enemy. They do. Yes. I do think that I, I, I think it's going to be Bitcoin that, or, you know, and maybe some, maybe gold to some extent, but look, like I think the last thirty years, it's been terrorism. What you call it, what people call terrorism in the West, which is I would probably say them holding us accountable for putting our boots on their neck, um, and doing basically the only thing they could do, which is, you know, shoot bows and arrows at us. You know, um, I think it's I think it's Bitcoin now. The next twenty years, right? This is how you know El Salvador has shown at least that it's possible to get off the teat. Um, has it been a success? Has, has it been enough of a, of a success or at least enough of um, 
a positive gain that somebody else will copy the the template. I think not having to re-up with the IMF was the like watershed moment for them, right? That um, I think that's got that's what people will see. That's what other countries will see. They'll say, "Oh my God, El Salvador stopped borrowing from the IMF." Nobody does that. Like you get (laughs) you get bombed for doing that. Yeah, you always have to double down when, when you're dealing with the IMF because then, you know, eventually you're close to default. Okay, let's restructure, borrow some more money and just keep going down this fucking rabbit hole. But you're right. Like, you, you make enemies. And Bukele, I, I have to give credit to his security because I, I would imagine he's a marked man by not just people in the IMF, but he, he's, like, made enemies with the United States and very powerful figures in the United States. He's been thumbing his nose on a lot of people. And still to this day, he's still doing the job. And he's with us, right? So, I mean, I just got to give credit yeah. to his security team. Indeed. I mean, you know, it's such an unlikely thing. I mean, just the history of the last 50 years just suggests that it's such a very unlikely thing that you will have an exception anywhere in the world, right? To the U.S. going in and taking both sides of civil war and just installing whoever they want. That's just that. That's the norm. It's a hundred percent, you know. It, so what El Salvador did is like the, you know, um, you know, like the, the problems Custodia Bank has getting its license, and they say yes, even like a small bank, if it's a hundred percent reserved, it'll it'll fuck the whole system up. It's like the, you know, the turd in the punch bowl, right? That ruins the whole punch bowl. I mean, I, I think that's what, <laughs> I think that's what little El Salvador might actually be. It's just like the whole turd in the punch bowl. That's an interesting analogy. Yeah. You know? Like, I, I, yeah. Should and, I go ahead? And, you know, yeah. I mean, like, we're, we're now we're, we're all realizing how much this shit stinks. And I, I do have to ask you because you're living in the States. I'm not. So I have no skin in the game, but indirectly I do. This coming election in just a few months away, we're like five months ish away from it. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. What do you think is going to happen? Trump is going to be, looks like the GOP nominee. Biden looks like he's going to be the Democratic nominee. But then you have RFK Jr. What he's tweeting out there, he's saying that he's he's polling decent enough that he could cause a problem for these two candidates. So I want to hear your take on this election. What's, what do you think is going to happen? Okay. I'm no expert. Um <clears throat> I'd like to say I, I would love to say I absolutely don't care what happens, but <laughs> it, it impacts us. But I mean, I would say the most dystopian outcome is the one where Trump doesn't win. Um, and you're talking to I was like the president of Trump Derangement Syndrome Club. Okay, um, I couldn't think straight for the whole, the time he was there. I'm it, I. Admit it. My head was up my ass, and I couldn't deal with it. Were you yelling when he was uh, when when he got uh, sworn in? Were you out there yelling at like that that great meme that's on YouTube? No, I just it just hurt. Like you know, the, like for me, I I felt just hurt by the whole thing. You know, I really felt like me, the idealist that I was about what American values are, what I thought they were. You know, I was look, I was watching like CNN all fucking day. I, I mean, you know, it was it was bad. <laughs> It was bad. You're in Pennsylvania. You're in, you're in, you know, it's, you know, it's and, a deep um, country. but so I say that to say that I like, if Trump doesn't win, it is an absolute dystopian nightmare there. There's no explanation. There will be no explanation for how that can possibly happen. Right. So th- at least that's how I feel. I do think RFK, yeah, can make prop, make some problems for both, but Ultimately, I don't know. Like, I I feel like RFK, it very at the very best did nothing for himself. Like, there was a time where I thought he was helping himself by jumping in this race, but he seems to be getting more and more fucking stupid as he becomes a presidential candidate. You know, he like <laughs> like the thing last week when he's like, oh, I'm going to put the whole bu- budget on a blockchain. Um, what the fuck does that mean? I I still don't understand it. I know. Well, my 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 guess is, um, my guess is like you know he was out at the ETH conference, right? 
he was. And my guess is he got more ETH donations in a day than he got Bitcoin donations since last May. Right. Do you think he, he's going to speak again at the next Bitcoin conference? I'm wondering if he's probably going to the- he probably will. But I, th- I think that he has bought into the shit coinery. I think they got him. Well, he's talked up Monero. I think it was. He's been very. That, I mean, that you could look, you could view that as based in a certain context, right? Well, come on, it, it, <laughs> I'm just saying, right? No, no, there's no fucking way. I'll, I'll, I'll explain why. There's no way you could verify how much is in circulation. You can't verify if it's been compromised in any way. This is not my wording. This is right from the Monero website. The, that seems to be a very trustworthy source. And if they say you can't accurately verify shit, well, fuck, then there's no way to figure out anything. You might as well still run the US dollar and have some other centralized entity run it. Fuck that. I'd rather have the ability to run my own node. No, totally. Like Bitcoin and but, do it cheaply and efficiently and verify everything. You can't do that in Monero. RFK is a public figure before becoming a presidential candidate was the guy that took down Fauci. Um, he was the guy that was fighting really the, the singular guy fighting for people's rights to avoid, you know, getting a vac- getting an unsafe vaccine that they don't want or whatever that they don't want. Right. He was that guy. Um, I'd say he was, you know, pretty, um, pretty noble and pretty high signal prior to becoming a presidential candidate. And I feel like he's a dipshit now. Like he has become dumber and dumber by the day. Right. And I think that it's like, it's like, you know, you go back to like Swan, the aspiration for public money just makes you, it just, it just worsens you. Right. And it's like running for president the same thing, you know, it's going to make you worse and worse and worse. It just exposes to the point where it's like that Simpsons episode, you know, where they found a crayon in Homer's head and when oh they, yeah yeah and they took it out he became a genius and they start putting yeah. it back they start putting it back in and he's like lottery tickets for everybody and they're like nope not dumb enough yet not dumb enough yet and it's like blockchain for the you know, put the budget on the blockchain you know it's like he's just <laughs> trying to prove yeah I don't know you know it's insane those were great episodes back in the day too yeah. I don't watch newer Simpsons but those earlier ones were fucking gold so yeah you know it's I think it's a good segue because. Those are the days which you know you and I are, I think, are fond of because of our age. And, and so you wanted to, to say something about a particular time and why it is, in your opinion, the best time. So, I mean, I go did. ahead. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Okay. So, um, well, first I, break it down. What is it we're talking about? So that people understand what the fuck it is. We're talking <laughs> about the year, the year 1994. One of my first observations when I got into Bitcoin was. It reminded me of 1994. Like I looked at the primitive tools we were using. You know, I was into the command line and, you know, these hardware wallets that are like kind of primitive. You know, it reminded me of how I felt in 1994, seeing all of these tools pop out. They were all in text and you all, you know, you had to, you had to do a little work to learn them. Right. But it kind of felt like 1994 again with like the internet. Um, that's the year that the internet came into my world. Um, were you using and, Unix at the time? Or like, yeah, uni- Unix. I, was, I went to Temple University and I had like an astro.temple.edu account and it was all Unix. Like we browsed the web through links. Links and Gopher and then you yeah. used Pine, I guess, for email. Pine, yep. Yeah. Oh, but I was God. big on IRC too. I was like huge on IRC. I can't remember what would be the IRC. Cl- I know Merck was the one for Windows. I can't even remember what it would be for on, on Unix. But I remember it's, it Telex. Uh, tel- sorry, Telnet. Telnet. Yeah, Telnet yeah, is how you got to your IRC. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, to me, it's a pivotal year. I didn't, you know, sometimes you don't realize that it's never going to get better. <laughs> like it's only going to go downhill. And you're sitting here in 2024. I go back to 1994. And I'm like, damn, that was maybe the greatest year right i have a look a, a small list of things just to just to take us back to 19 i want to hear it all right um, it may be 2024 out there but in here the cvp at this particular moment is 1994 so i mentioned about i mentioned like the internet usenet groups irc like the internet yeah okay now your yours and my favorite game nhl 94 which there it is happened I mean, let's be honest. That was 1993. 
but they but released it, that latter half of 93 but it is you know yeah. it's nhl 94 okay and it's the goat of games okay uh, i agree okay um you know most of us were just i'll just say myself smoking weed in college playing nhl 94 and then the internet came along i mean great you were the great. idiot savant weren't you uh, yes, I, I I was. We get into that. Let me let me get through this list though. This is so. Um, <laughs> mo- I'm gonna just name the some of the movies that came out in 1994. Pulp Fiction, Shawshank. I'm gonna Red- say that right away. Pulp Fiction. What a Dude. great movie. Incredible. Shawshank Redemption, Forrest Gump, Dumb and Dumber, Clerks, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. God damn. Right. Good year. You can't. I don't think that that many great movies have come out since 1994. I might say. Okay. Uh, you had OJ? Yes. Okay. <laughs> OJ murdered his wife and a waiter. And, and you, it became the media circus we all found it to be incredible. Um, there was another great, all-time great video game called NBA Jam. And yes. It, it existed in a time of arcades where you could play the stand-up with a friend two-on-two. Yeah. Incredible. Um, now, here's one that – here's the last thing on my list, and it's – a little, a little relevant to NHL 94, I say. Okay, so I talk a lot about this band Fish. I don't know if they're get, they didn't really, they didn't really get big in Canada, but I had some friends in Canada who were definitely into them. I'm not familiar with them. So Fish is probably so in 1994 they were basically the band that was going to take the torch from the Grateful Dead. And it turned out in 1995 Jerry Garcia died, and that's exactly what happened. And Fish became like to the point where. You know, there is no second best. Like they, they're in a category by themselves and popular. I'd say popularity, staying power for a band of that, a rock band and a jam band of that genre. But in 1994, they began something that they were very known for, which was a Halloween tradition where they would cover an album. Okay. So they would be, they would like putting on a costume, they would cover an album. And I talk about this in relation to the, Halloween 2008 release of the white paper. In mm. 1994, Fish did the Beatles' white album. I heard you talk about this. Yes. yes. So they, they they began and and Mark Lesser, <laughs> Mark Lesser, the not the creator, but he he was really the what was he the coder? He, he was the programmer behind 94, 95. Yeah. So and a whole bunch of other games too, by the so, way. I saw Mark Lesser in an NHL 94 documentary say that he was living up in Maine, okay, mm-hmm. while he was making the game, and he believes that there were there was a special spiritual thing happening between him and the people that he was with, right? Number one. Number two, the University of Maine hockey team was going on this championship run that had never been seen before. Paul Korea was part of that team, right? I do not know. I just know that Mark Lesser connected this spiritual vector of this team, the energy of this team winning to the spiritual connection of him and his fellow programmers to create this like chimeric event of how special NHL 94 was. But what I'm going to tell you is that in 1994, Fish was up in Vermont just coming out of their shell and being ready to take the torch from the Grateful Dead and just crushing and adding to that vector. And I say, maybe it's part of that specialness. It wasn't a mere coincidence. There was a plan behind everything. That's right. And there were a couple of things that were not so good for Canada in 1994. I have to disclose. I have to disclaim. Okay. Well, so at least they- got blown out in the, the semis against Vancouver. Well, so the, um, yeah, yes. The World Series was canceled when the Expos were fucking crushing. Yeah, they had a good team with Larry Walker, Pedro Martinez. Yeah, they they were they were poised to win at all that year. So that was kind of rough. And you know, yeah, the Canadians winning. That was like the I think that was the last time Canadian team won. It was the year before. It was ninety three. They won. Yeah, that's right. And then, but that was the last time any team from Canada. Yep. I don't know if that's happened. I don't. I don't know if that's been broken in the last few years, or if that's still the case. No, no, it's the same thing. They have no Canadian yeah. team has won a Stanley Cup since 1993. The Habs. So Canada paid a price. However, uh, Fred Van Vliet was born in 1994. So, um, you know, who's he? He is probably the reason the Raptors won 
the championship in 2019. Okay. I, I don't watch the much sports in the past 15 yeah. years, including basketball. So yeah, there you go. So there, there you go. Yeah. Um, now NHL 94 really was, um, it really was special to me growing up. And I, I have to say, like, I felt an immediate connection to you finding out that a, you know, the game still exists and B that you're so, you know, so into it. Right. Because that's it. I was that there's, into it. So there's a bunch of guys from Philadelphia that apparently are really fucking good in the game. They there's a tournament that's run every year called the King of Ninety Four. Yeah. And in the early editions of that, it's now ten years ish or so it's been running. The early editions, apparently these guys came out of nowhere from Philadelphia, came in and just fucking cleaned the clocks of a whole bunch of people. And they don't play online, they just play amongst themselves. And I think they call themselves the four horsemen or something like that. Just four guys just so yeah, fuck me. Maybe you came across them one time. But. It may like when I like in my prime, right? Was the summer of '94. I was living in my first apartment in Philly, and people would, were coming over, like strangers from the internet were coming over to play. You know, which is pretty cool. So uh, you know, when the game came out, um, I didn't actually have a Sega. We all went to a friend's house. He had it, and I was just destroying. Like this is what made everyone so mad because it wasn't even my game. And somehow I was just able to pick it up. I mean, you know, we weren't good. Like I see now, like, like I even like you know, we didn't know about a lot of the techniques that you see now. You know what I mean? You had breakaways. Everyone knew how to do the breakaway, and you know, we had one timers, but we didn't really. We really weren't very sophisticated. I just happened to be like autistic enough to never let up and then just be able to, you know, like uh, ne- you know what I mean? Just never, you know, never, never let the energy down at all. And just, I, I loved when my friends would throw their fucking controllers. Uh, it's just the best. Pissing somebody off. Rage quitting is, <laughs> but unfortunately you don't get to see that a lot on the internet for what I mean yeah. I play on the internet and nobody I have come across that just put their controller down or quit the game. Everyone's gone to the bitter end. And even I got thrashed recently, 14 nil in one match. <laughs> it was disgusting, but I, I love, stuck through it. <laughs> I love the streams you do when you're, when you guys are talking, like I watch, yeah. I watch them all, but like, it's really cool when you're talking to your opponent. It's very infrequent that happens. I'll be yeah. honest. Nobody wants to, because it, it takes, they, they think that they're less doing less concentration than the game. And there's talking more and it's taking away from the game itself. But for I me, I see that. I see that. I'd prefer to chat yeah. when I play and it's not like I'm trash talking, but I just, you know, there's some banter go back and forth, but I'm with you, man. But, um, unfortunately, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a minority here, but yeah. Anyways, uh, uh, it's getting close to an hour. So I think it's, it's probably a good time to, to cut it quits. But before I do, I just want to, to pass over the baton to you if, in case people want to find you where they could find you. Maybe you could do one last plug for your podcast. So man, yeah, the floor is yours. I would say, yeah, check out Rock, Paper, Bitcoin. Um, I started these short rips, um, you know, I like realizing that I I really wanted to get give the room for Business Cat to get this, you know, to get this big idea out there, you know. So I started doing just shorter rips. Um, so that's something called the fundamentals of fundamentals. And those are episodes. Are like, <laughs> the episodes are fundamentals of something. So like the last one I did was the fundamentals of stand up, where I um, told a couple stories about getting heckled and how I, how I managed to deal with it. And so it's like the, every episode is the fundamentals of something. And you got to go, you have to have balls to do that, by the way, to, to stand up and do, because you're, you're basically throwing yourself out there for everybody to challenge you. So good for you. Oh, absolutely. You really are out there. I mean, I yeah. definitely like, I think like, it takes a lot of thick skin, I think, to be in Bitcoin, right? It takes a lot of thick skin in the world just to have conviction about something that nobody thinks is good, right? Um, so it's good. Uh, it's a good thing. I, so many people in Bitcoin tell me they're trying, they're thinking about doing stand up, which is kind of cool. Um, so fundamentals of fundamentals, rock paper Bitcoin, um, and I would say. Yeah, that's it. Uh, hang out. We have a Telegram, Rock, Paper, Bitcoin. Check out the podcast. Come to Telegram. Tell us how fucked we are. Um, it's all good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's fundamentals. Thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been a blast. 
And we'll be back again on Monday. But for people who want it to get links for fundamentals, it's in the show notes below. So just be click it. You're, you're on your way there. So, yeah, thanks so much for showing up for this riff, fundamentals. Thank you, bud. Are you a fan of the old school NHL 94 game on the Genesis or SNES? Why not check out my show, the NHL 94 podcast, from tournaments and tactics to the people who make up this community. Check it out wherever you listen to podcasts or find it on YouTube.